talking about. Okay, next Sunday, we will be outside for our drive-in service, one service, 10 o'clock. Uh, we will, uh, we'll keep it to about 45 minutes so that, because we don't have, you know, regular bathroom facilities over there, but we're starting at 10 o'clock, uh, get it there a little early, get a good parking spot. Uh, you can sit outside, bring your chair, sit outside. We're going to have a great time of worship, um, and, and just in, in ministry of the word as we, we celebrate Memorial Day. We're going to do something a little different. I don't know how it's going to work. It's going to be maybe a little awkward and choppy, but we're actually going to have, uh, have communion next Sunday uh, outside. So uh, just be prepared for that as we celebrate Memorial Day as our nation and all those who have given their life. We want to celebrate the one who not only gave his life but saved us. And so we are thankful for that. I'm really thrilled this morning to, we have someone who's coming for um, a little bit just to share a few minutes, and, uh, and that is Zach Vaughn. Zach is, um, is a newly appointed missionary with the Church of God. Zach actually attended uh, preschool and elementary school here, ended up graduating from uh, Delmarva Christian. He went to Lee University and graduated. He has spent the last two years in Mongolia. And uh, he will be leaving in August to go to Japan as a missionary. And so uh, some of you know may, you may know his parents, Mike and Lisa Vaughn. They, they pastor in Frankfurt. And um, just kind of connected and heard that Zach was, was going to be going to the mission field. And I said, you know, as a church, I want to be able to sow in a young missionary's life. So at the end of the service, there will be a, as you walk out, you can't miss it. There will be a, an offering plate. If you would like to sow into his life, we're going to ask you to do that. You can write it to the church and we'll give one, ch- one check to him. But I'm, I want to ask Zach to come, missionary Zach Vaughn, who will be going to Japan in August. Would you give him a hand as he comes to share with us? Thank you so much, Pastor Dukes, for having me come. I'm truly honored and I really thank God for just his goodness in bringing me all the way from Epworth all the way here and it's from Epworth Christian's investment in my life and I cannot thank God enough for what he's done but um, as Pastor Duke said I am have just come back from Mongolia spending two years that are doing university student outreach there to, the, to Russians Mongolians South Koreans And even during the COVID pandemic, when (laughs) while America was forced to wear masks, we were forced to be locked up inside our houses, but God was still faithful and we were able to reach the lost still. And so while I was there in Mongolia, I was actually really content to stay there a couple more years. But um, as I was praying more, the Lord really impressed my heart for Tokyo. There in Tokyo, oh, in Japan alone, is 1% Christian. Wow. Yeah. It's already considered an unreached nation. And so there are churches there. I'll be working with the church organization there. I'll be working with Church of God at a new church plant there. And basically, the New York Times Square of Tokyo, there's about seven or eight universities around that area. One university I researched a little bit that's probably five minutes away from the church has 20,000 students. Now remember that ratio. 1% doesn't know Jesus. 1% of the whole nation. Tokyo has 13 million people living there. Imagine 1% of 13 million only know Jesus. Suicide rate among young people is intense, even more so with COVID having to be locked inside their homes. Because of academic pressures, because of the social and cultural structures there, young people can't fit in. They don't have hope. The work environment is so intense over there. It's 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Consistent. You put your job before your family. It's so unreal, the pressure that these people face, and they don't know God. They don't have hope. They don't, they can't look at the sunset and be like, wow, God, you're with me. You're for me. They don't know him. They don't know someone's out there that loves them. They don't know there's someone there that has plans for them. And so I want to share with you one scripture verse 
If you do have your Bible apps, um, or if you have your traditional Bibles, hands off to those that have their traditional Bibles. (laughs) (laughs) But turn with me really quick to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. If you got it, say amen. If you don't, say wait. (laughs) Isaiah 61, verse 1. It says, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and proclaim the captives will be released. And the prisoners will be set free. Through your prayers and your support, I'm able to go and be that representative. To go and proclaim the good news to the lost, to the hurting, to those that don't even know God. To those that don't even have hope for tomorrow. Through the Holy Spirit that I can proclaim good news and that The Holy Spirit through me can speak to these people and heal their hearts. Not just their bodies, but their emotional needs. Their mental needs. And set them free from the addictions that hold them down. A lot of young people there struggle with depression. A lot of people there struggle with addictions that, such as pornography, alcoholism. You know what? Culturally, they can't even open up unless they get drunk. Here, I can talk to Pastor Dukes and tell him how I'm feeling. There, it's taboo to talk to someone about how you feel. (laughs) Could you imagine that? You can't tell anyone that you're upset. Could you imagine you're angry and you can't tell anyone about it? You don't have God to even talk to because you don't know him yet. Could you imagine that? That's why the Lord is sending me to go out there. And I want to be faithful to what he's asked me to do. And I ask for for you, Central Worship Center, if you would, one, keep me in your prayers. 1% Christian out of hundreds of years. It's a hard nation to share the gospel to. It's a hard nation to build relationships with the people. So pray for me as I'm studying the language, as I'm going to these universities around my church and sharing the gospel to students there. Pray that God would open hearts and God would just open doors for ministry to take place. Secondly, how you can give is uh, supporting me financially whether that's a one-time blessing, however the Lord leads you, and you wanting to say, you know what, I can't go to Japan with you, Zach, but I want to sow in what God's going to do in your life. I want to partner with what God wants to do in Japan. And you can come see me after service. I have these little uh, handout cards that kind of tell you about my life, my prayer needs, how you can give, and you can come see me after service and do that. But Know that you are partnering with what God's already doing in the mission field. No, it's not you're really supporting me, but partnering with God and what he wants to do. Amen. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. I deeply appreciate Epworth's investment in my life. And I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces. Miss Swain, so good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I went to school with her daughter. I know Jacob Calloway. <laughs> I see Mr. Henry in the background and Mr. Swain in the background. (laughs) Awesome people in my life, and I can't thank you all for your investment in mine. God bless you all. Look forward to seeing you. Amen. Thank you, Zach. And let's just take a moment. Let's pray for Zach. I also want to mention we want to continue to pray for Ms. Shelby Johnson as she's going through a rehab at the Manor House, and then also Ms. Betty Covey, who had... Uh, hip surgery from breaking her hip last week. 
Um, and you know, I know there's many others that, that really need a touch of God. But also, to Zach, after the next service, he's going to share for a few minutes for the next service. And then he's going to go down in, in, in our children's ministry. And, you know, you never know what God will do by the things he says in the hearts of our children. And that this morning, an hour from now, that we could have children in our children's ministry that feel called to the mission field. Wouldn't that be awesome? And uh, it was great to have Zach as a senior. He actually went with us to Jamaica on a missions trip. And so we're thankful for what God has done. Let's just take a minute. Let's pray over him and and lift up these other requests. God, thank you that uh, before Zach was ever born, Lord, you already had a plan designed for him. And Lord, you knew that this day would happen and that he would be here and that, Lord, that uh, he would be sharing his heart for the people of Japan, Tokyo. God, the people uh, walking in darkness that need the light of Jesus. Lord, I pray that through church planning, through college ministry, just through walking in, in, in the city of Tokyo, God, I pray the Spirit of God would rest on him. And that, Lord, that there would be a great harvest that would come. Uh, because of his life and his willingness to go, in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Betty Covey. God, we pray for your hand upon her. God, we pray you give the doctors and nurses wisdom as she transitions soon out to a rehabilitation place to, to learn to use that hip. And Father, we pray your hand would rest on her. Lord, let healing come in her. Lord, we pray for Miss Shelby that that words would begin to flow from her. And God, that you would touch her body. You would bring healing to her. And God, thank you that you're a God that we can come to. And that, that Lord, that we can come before and we can bring our needs. And Lord, that you're a God that hears us. And Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's really a great... Um, I've always had respect since I was a little boy growing up in this church that was always such a missions church too, that someone that will respond, that will leave the comforts of home in America and will go to another culture. And so just before we came out, a worship team was practicing, and they, they went to tell Holly, who wasn't here then, about the great sacrifice that they made that on Good Friday when they were practicing outside for our Easter service that was going to be outside, that as the worship team was practicing, it was, it was flurrying. It was so cold that day. Albert had gloves on to play the piano, and he pulled him off just before he practiced. And I looked at Zach, and I said, and you want to talk about your sacrifice in Mongolia? Man, they were, they were practicing worship while it was snowing outside. You know, that's the real sacrifice, so we had a good time with it. But we're excited, though, about Zach's life and, and what God is really neat, how our paths have kind of intertwined. And his, his mom actually came here. We, we were in school together. Uh, at Epworth, and then she actually came to Valley Forge when I was there, and so great, uh, great to see Zach's life and what what God is doing with him. Uh, I, w- I want to follow up on uh, on on John chapter four. I don't know, but I'm still fascinated with this story in John four. Jesus goes to the well. Remember, I said the well was sitting on the well, and and Jesus is sitting on the well, and he begins to speak to this lady, he begins to speak into her life. And, and it, it, it so much just grabbed her heart and her soul and her spirit. And as she did in verse, uh, verse 27, uh, this lady uh, in verse 25, uh, she said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus looked at her and said, I'm the Christ. I'm the one. And she has this reality because what Jesus has spoken into her life and and told her. And just about then the disciples come back and and, and they are um, they're ready to you know to set up and have this meal. And and she goes back into the community and she says, Listen, she said, You guys gotta hear this man. This guy sitting at the well, he told me everything about my life. He told me everything that 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 I ever did. He knew it. And she said, Could he be the Christ? Could he be the Messiah? Ironically, when the disciples, they're not even worried. They don't know what has happened with the Samaritan woman. They're just, you know, they're just, they're busy about their agenda. Have you ever been so busy about your agenda that you miss the opportunity of what God was trying to do? I remember many years ago, 
uh, when I was in Virginia, I'd, I was youth pastor. I was building a house. And there was an old farmhand that worked down down to the end of this dirt lane where I had built the home. And, and so I went down to see Mr. Jim. And Mr. Jim never attended church. Um, he, he, was a, you know, he was a nice hard worker. Um, but, you know, he had some habits that we would say as a church were not Christian habits. But I, I just kind of built a relationship with this, this old farmhand. And so I just went down, and as we were building this house, I, I wanted to see if, if I, and everybody called him Old Man Jim. So I said, hey, Old Man Jim, I said, would you, would you mind someday bringing your bush hog up and just and cutting, uh, cutting, cutting my yard? Because, you know, it was about like this high as we were building the house, and my, I knew my lawnmower, push mower wouldn't get through it. Didn't have a riding lawnmower then. I don't think they've been invented. And, and when the first time I asked him, Jim said, yeah, I'll get to it. He said, but I got to tell you, I need God. And I didn't even hear what the man said. I, I was so consumed with, with my weeds in my yard that needed a bush hog to them that I, I said it again. I said, Jim, I said, so do you think you'll be able to get the bush hog sometime this week and cut my weeds and you know cut her down good so then I can cut it with my push mower. And he said, yeah, I said, I'll get to it, but I tell you, I need God. And I asked him again the third time. Finally, the third time, I caught what he said. And I looked at him and I said, I said, Jim, I said, what are you trying to say? He said, I really need God in my life. And I, I looked at old man Jim and I said, in my mind, I was really thinking, I really want this bush hog here. But suddenly, I, I got in tune to what he was. This was an outcry of this man's heart. I don't know. I didn't know what was going on. I found out just a short time later. Jim had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he knew me as the young youth pastor at the church at the end of the road. And he told me three times he needed God. And I, I knelt there with him right by the farm equipment at the end of the road past the home I was building. And that day, I, I led old man Jim to the Lord. And I, I, I got to tell you, I'm a little embarrassed that it did take me three times to catch on. But I'm thankful the third time because three weeks later, old man Jim died, and I did his funeral. And I was able to share that story. Thank God, thank God Jim just didn't say it once. We can get so consumed with things. So the disciples get back. They're so consumed. That they don't even care about the woman at the well. They don't care that Jesus has just spoken uh, uh, transforming words to her life and that she would never, ever be the same again. All they were worried about was putting this meal together. And I won't read the rest of the chapter, but, but this is where Jesus begins to talk about the harvest, that the harvest is, is plentiful, but the workers are few. And the disciples missed it. But this lady, she walked away. And, and I imagine that she really didn't walk away. I would say she ran back to town. Why? Because she became fascinated with Jesus. She became so intrigued with him. And, you know, just as Albert shared, if we can find ways to be fascinated with Jesus, whenever we lose that, that, that fact of being fascinated with who Jesus is and what he does, we will, come, we will become very bored with Christianity. There is something about maintaining that sense of fascination before God. This moment with this lady, it became a transforming moment when she became fascinated with Jesus. Her life would never, ever be the same again. And because of that, this lady, she became the seed that was planted and later on in the book of Acts, several years later, when Philip showed up, Philip showed up to reap the seeds that had been planted that day at the well. I have no doubt whatsoever. This lady, you know, she, she really had a choice, and it was to hold on to her past or to walk in transformation. Hold on to her past or walk in transformation. There would always be people that would remind her of her past. There would be very few, very few people that re would remind her of her future. And, you know, people are really good at reminding us of our past. In fact, they excel in that. They will remind you and remind you and remind you of what you did wrong. And very few people will, will look at your past and say, I know it. 
and it's okay. Because I'm not so much concerned about that. I'm concerned about your future and what you do from here. It's hard to undo things that we've done in the past. But our future is before us. I love this phrase. Probably 15, 18 years ago, I walked into Jamaica Teen Challenge into the cafeteria. And they had a banner up with these words. Facilitating life transformation. It was kind of the slogan that the Jamaica Teen Challenge was was saying that that's what their ministry is about. When I heard those words, I thought, you know, that just shouldn't be for Jamaica Teen Challenge. That should be for the church of Jesus Christ. We exist to help facilitate life transformation. When Jesus met this woman at the well, she had no idea who she was walking into the presence of. But when we walk into the presence of God, Jesse DePlantis, he said it like this. He said, one moment in the presence of God can impact your entire life. It can change you forever. It will change you forever. I I love the words that the Apostle Paul said. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, he knew that his life was really coming to an end. He's in prison and he's writing this. And he says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took of me. When, when I read that verse, it reminds me of kind of what we sung about this morning, about the goodness of God coming after us. We, we talk about being in pursuit of God. I've shared this before, but you know, one of the books that had, had such an impact on my life was Tommy Tenney's book, The God Chaser. And, and in, that, in that book, you know, he, he shares the, the fact that when, when we get to the point where we are passionate in our relationship with Christ and, and we are pursuing Christ, what really happens in our pursuit of him is he captures us. He captures our heart. That's exactly what Paul is saying. He said, man, as I am in pursuit of God, as I press on towards Christ, Christ grabs hold of me. That's a relationship with the Creator. That's a relationship with an eternal God that he, ta- he grabs hold of us. He grabs hold of our heart. And then he said, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, listen to this. Now, if we went back to the book of Acts where we were last week, if you remember that the beginning of that chapter we read, Saul was standing there giving approval of Stephen's death. And then it says he was going house to house and he was dragging out people who said they were Christians. And so now here we are in Philippians, and Paul's in jail for the cause of Christ because Saul became Paul, and he writes these words, forgetting what is behind me. Now, can you imagine within the church in those days if Paul showed up in the church? after he gave approval of Stephen being stoned to death, after he went house to house and he drugged people out and put them in prison because they admitted that they were followers of Christ, and then suddenly he shows up in their church? I don't know about you, but I would say the church would probably want to remind him of what he used to do. He didn't just have a bad life. He had a violent life in the past. And and in doing so, Paul has to say these words. I'm forgetting what is behind me. And I'm straining towards what is ahead. He didn't say it's easy to forget the past. He said, man, I am straining towards something moving forward. I press on. It's not easy forgetting the past. It it would be nice to think, you know, we know that we come to Christ and that he erases it off. But we can't erase it out of our mind sometimes. We can't erase it out of our heart. You know, sin is kind of like when you get cut, you have a scar. And that scar will heal, but there's always a mark there. 
Sin leaves a residue on us. Thank God for his blood. And Paul says, I press on towards the goal. I'm straining towards what I'm moving for. It's not easy to forget the past, and oftentimes people remind me of it. But I'm pressing on. I won't quit because I want to win the prize for which God has called me heaven, heavenward in Christ Jesus. So while I was in the hospital, I'm watching this video, and it's of Bishop T.D. Jakes. And I, I, I admire T.D. Jakes. I, I wish I had his voice so I could preach like he did. But if I preach five minutes like that, I would have no voice. But what I've found is over the years that, that Bishop T.D. Jakes has actually become much more of a teacher. And I was watching him in his video, and, and he begins the video by telling the story. He tells a story as a little boy in Charleston, West Virginia, where he was raised. And they had a house that had been, the back side of the house was built into the back of a mountain. And, and the front side of the house was, um, was actually built, and it was on, two, it was on four befores. And so the, the front of the house was kind of open uh, underneath it. And, and so he said that one day mom and dad came home, and they, they brought him a puppy. And he said, he looked at this puppy, and he knew the puppy, that knew because of the kind of dog he was, he was going to become a big dog. But he said, that, you know, they looked at him, he said, I'm just a little boy. And they said, what do you want to name this puppy? He said, I don't know. He said, I kind of like the name Pup. So they named this dog Pup, and Pup grew up to be a big dog. And, and he said, Pup was a pretty ferocious dog. He had a big bark. And he said, nobody would come up to our house because of Pup unless we held on to Pup. And they said, we kept Pup on a chain, and ch that chain was attached to the four before, which, which, was, which was attached to the entire house. And he said, Pup, when a car would go by or somebody would go walking by, he said, Pup would run out as far as that chain would let him go. And then, of course, that chain would stop him, but he would bark. And he said, day after day, month after month, Pup protected us. But something that Pup learned over time is that as far as he wanted to go, he could only go so far because what was behind him was greater than what was in front of him. And as he tells the story, I began to think about life, how sometimes our past and our mind is so great that we can never we can never capture the future. That our past, it haunts, it reminds us of something of how we used to be or something that we did or something that happened to us and that we can never really move forward because we're still attached to it. He said, although Pup got bigger, in his mind, Pup knew he could only go so far and that chain stopped him because the thing he was attached to was bigger than the thing he wanted. That's how we are many times. We are labeled. We are pinpointed. We are reminded of the past. And it keeps us chained to something that is larger behind us than something that is before us. Then Bishop Jake says, then there was one day, this guy went by on a bicycle. And something in Pup's heart decided that the guy on the bicycle was bigger than the house that he was attached to. And Pup took off running and barking. And when he reached the end where that chain got tight, the chain broke. And T.D. Jakes didn't tell the rest of the story. I don't know what happened to the guy on the bike, but I would venture to say that he became an Olympian bike rider from then on as Pup began to chase after him. But as I, as, as I think about this, this woman at the well, it would have been very easy for her to develop the Pup mentality. 
that I can only go so far. This chain only lets me go so far, and it keeps me attached to my past. And the only way that we can break from our past is to know that there's a future. There's something greater that we can pursue. And when we begin to pursue it, we never know what God will do in it. Now, the Scripture doesn't pick up after John 4 of the Samaritan woman. And and, and Samaria is really not even mentioned after this until after the persecution in Jerusalem. And and Philip says, man, I'm out of here. I'm not staying in Jerusalem. I'm going to go share this gospel that changed my life. And I think I'm going to God-ordain, God-designed, God said, go to Japan. God said, go to Samaria. Why did he go to Samaria? Because this woman at the well, whose life was not perfect, who had been chained to the house for a long time, she became the seed of revival in Acts 7 and 8. She became the seed. She was the seed that became the harvest of revival in Samaria. The people that the Jews were not supposed to associate with. And now Philip goes there and Philip preaches the gospel. And and manifestations begin to happen. And people begin to be set free from demonic spirits. And and people uh, that are are, uh, diseased are healed. And and there becomes life transformation because one person broke the chain. A Samaritan woman. Probably, if you looked in Samaria at the time that Jesus sat on the well, she probably really was the most unlikely candidate. One, because she was a female. And two, because of her previous lifestyle. I'm so glad that God doesn't care if you're male or female. God doesn't care about your past. He only cares about your future as you press on towards that. Let me close with this. C.S. Lewis said, There are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. Than any we leave behind. Would you just bow your heads with me this morning? Could we just stand to our feet this morning? just as a kind of a sign of surrender as we stand. If there are things in your heart, things in your life, that you know, honestly, they hold you back, I I want to ask you just to lift your hands to the Lord this morning. And as you lift your hands, what you're really saying is, God, I surrender to you. God, I surrender my past. I surrender my sins. I surrender my stakes. God, I surrender what people have done to me. God, I surrender what people have said to me. I surrender the actions other people have committed to me. Lord, the things that I've done, God, I surrender to you. Lord, it's my past. God, help me to see my future in you. Lord, I surrender to you, Father. God, I surrender to you. I am yours. Lord, I pray all over this building, all over this building, Lord, we surrender to you. God, help us to know that our past is our past and our future is in you. And Lord, because of that, we can follow after you. Lord, in Jesus' name, God, hear our hearts cry this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Also, just want to share with you as, as we close out here that if if you did not come prepared to, to give and to sow into Zach's life, you can go to our website and um, you can, there's a special place you can go on 
there, and you can actually type his name in and, and give directly uh, to that. And if you have any questions, see Marisa on the way out. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Remember, Wednesday night we're here, or you can watch online. And next Sunday at 10 o'clock over on the field. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome week.
to worship center. Look at all these beautiful faces ready to worship the Lord. Amen. I want to open up with a scripture this morning. It was in my devotional this morning. I just wanted to share it with you guys. And it kind of it was a short a testimony I shared in the first service. And it kind of lines up with this. And it's John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. And it says, my sheep hear my voice. This is Jesus talking. So we need to be listening. Jesus talking. <laughs> my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Amen. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. There is no place you can't go, no place that you could travel where God can't bring you back. No place. And we need to be, and I, there was a testimony about it. This, I won't, I'm not going to share it because I heard some other preaching that we had up here, the worship team. I'm going to give them the time this morning because they had some really good stuff. But we need to be living out our lives with God present and visible in all things. Because there are people right now, and I saw it this week firsthand, where people that you never, ever, ever, ever thought would just come out of nowhere and start asking about Jesus, started asking about Jesus this week. And not because of any scripture that we read out loud and not because of any sermon they heard, but because we were walking our lives this week with Jesus out front in front of everything. When everything was come, came crashing down and everything was falling apart, instead of getting angry and mad, we were praising Jesus. Instead of taking it out on other people, we were giving and praying and loving on them. And all of a sudden on Saturday when everything's going falling apart, instead of them reaching to the things they used to reach to, they asked the question, Jesus and fate. Do you believe in spiritual fate? Absolutely. When you surrender to God, there is a fate and a purpose waiting for you, but you got to walk it. you got to walk it. And those people have a fate waiting for them if they would just believe in him and start walking. But they got to see it. We're all, we all have a little bit of Thomas in us. We, we, we got to see it. we got to see the holes in our hands. And guess what? Christ died on the cross for us so we could walk around with the holes in our hands. We carry those. We carry the cross. We carry the burdens. We carry the wounds with us. Everywhere we go, will we surrender to the world and to the flesh or will we stop and praise Jesus and worship him wherever we stand in the very moment when Satan wants to destroy everything that he's built? Amen. So the importance of worship, we got to worship. We got to worship everywhere all the time. Amen. So let's rise and open up our, uh, our service with a prayer and let's worship from deep down inside in a place that shows God you can count on us to walk out there. And have your light shown to those who need to see it the most. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to worship and to love and to cherish. To praise, proclaim, and pray in your name. Lord, we're asking for mountains to be moved. Or if you don't want the mountain to be moved because you want them to believe they can climb the mountain, whatever it is, Lord, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to guide us, help us, and strengthen us to carry out the mission. Lord, your works need to be done now more than ever. We see that. We see what you're doing. We thank you for everything because everything that you're doing is an opportunity, good and bad. It's an opportunity to show what God has done for us and what he can do for us when we surrender to you. So, Lord, we are surrendering to you as a church today. We're giving you everything we got. We're surrendering all our burdens, our cares, our sins. We're repenting for everything that we've done because we know that you will forgive us and enlighten us and guide us and restore us. So in Jesus' name today, Lord, we want to worship with the Holy Spirit. Let it come into this place and wreck us. Let it change us, transform us so that we walk out the door. We're high-stepping all the way out to the world where they can see us high-stepping for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us worship. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Amen. was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us come down spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room 
Fire and wind. 